As the Insider Exclusive Investigative News Team travels across America producing the Justice in America Network TV series, we invite you to join us as we uncover real stories about the issues that promote justice and fairness for injured people, safeguards victims' rights, and the opportunity to help guide the hands of justice, especially when people's lives have been destroyed, families ruined, dreams lost, or widespread societal change and reform are needed. These true stories about real, ordinary people, their real lives, always up close and personal, and always unfiltered stories of unimaginable pain, suffering, and great wrongs, but also of courage and faith and the dauntlessness of the human spirit. These stories are also about the trial lawyers who helped these ordinary people navigate a very complex legal system to get justice as they faced extreme life-altering adversities and how the government and big business with their million-dollar PR campaigns are slowly eroding our rights to seek justice and making an end run around the civil justice system. Our TV stories show relief and vindication for shattered lives and seemingly lost souls. The compassion, warmth, love, and determination of the human spirit found within these shows are neither imagined nor contrived. They are truly personal crusades and telling journeys of what it means to seek justice in the American courtroom. In this insider-exclusive network TV special, Justice in America, The Truths and Myths of Tort Reform, we visit with Bill Pickett, founder of the Pickett Law Firm as he takes us inside today's legal system, examining lawyers' strategies, clients' thoughts, and in vivid detail, showing you the often heartbreaking stories of these clients, dramatically demonstrating what motivates trial lawyers to fight for their clients' causes. Some of these same trial lawyers have been in the crosshairs of attacks by so-called tort reform advocates for the past 30 years. These attacks are not new. Now, a lot of you have heard and read about tort reform, but really don't understand how or what it really means, or how it affects us negatively every time we walk into the courtroom. So in this special Network TV Insider exclusive documentary, Justice in America, The Truths and Myths of Tort Reform, we will show you how tort reform is making justice more and more difficult for the average American. And we're not going to do it by words or fancy language, but by inviting you along to meet our guests and their lawyers in small towns and big cities filmed across America, who've had the unfortunate bad luck to be severely injured or victimized by big businesses, the government, or law enforcement. These victims could be you or me one day, and if you are so unlucky, you will quickly find out that justice in America is a hard-won battle where very few companies and individuals do the right thing and you need trial warriors who wage a battle with their own financial resources to get their clients justice. But before we get started, just for the record, let's define what the heck tort reform means in simple language. Tort is a legal term describing the system of compensation used by the courts to assign remedies, awards, and damages for harm done by one party to another, be it to their person, property, or other protected interest. Tort law defines what constitutes a legal injury and establishes liability. It's the civil court's answer to criminal law. Tort reform, then, is the political term for the controversial issue of reducing tort litigation, awards, damages, and or compensation. Now, tort reform isn't one single idea or law. Instead, it's a group of ideas and laws designed to change the way our civil justice system works. While each tort reform law is different, they all share one or more of the following goals. To make it more difficult for injured people to file a lawsuit, to make it more difficult for injured people to obtain a jury trial, and to put limits on the amount of money injured people receive in a lawsuit. Keep in mind that throughout history, our civil justice system has kept Americans safe by allowing them a fair chance to receive justice when they are injured by the negligence of others, even when it means taking on the most powerful corporations. When corporations and their CEOs act irresponsibly by cutting corners on safety, producing unsafe products, polluting our environment, or swindling their employees and shareholders, the last resort to hold them accountable is in our courts. The legal system provides justice to those injured by deliberate misconduct and deters future misconduct by holding wrongdoers accountable. 
Here's just a quick review of a few Justice in America Network TV show segments of these real case stories of ordinary people, their real lives, and their trial lawyers who've helped these ordinary folks navigate a very complex legal system to get justice as they faced extreme life-altering adversities. Real cases that promote justice and fairness for injured people safeguards victims' rights and the opportunity to help guide the hands of justice. Especially when people's lives have been destroyed, families ruined, dreams lost, or widespread societal change and reform are needed. And how the government and big business are slowly eroding our rights to seek justice, making an end run around the civil justice system and calling it tort reform. For many of the nearly 50,000 9-11 first responders, the wounds of the Twin Tower attacks are far from healing. These rescue workers continue to struggle with respiratory illness, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder, and many of them may be at increased risk for developing a number of cancers. Because they and their fellow rescue workers were picking through rubble littered with asbestos, mercury, crushed fluorescent light bulbs, and other known toxins, and they were outfitted with only their normal uniform to protect them from potential contaminants. When hundreds of victims and their families were left struggling with impending health problems and emotional instabilities after the World Trade Center attacks, the Uniform Firefighters Association of Greater New York selected one law firm, Sullivan, Papain, Block, McGrath, and Canavo, their friends and trusted legal advisors for the past 20 years, to come to their rescue. Because sometimes, even first responders need to be saved. I was promised a better life, far away from my home. I used to have a family. Now, I must pay for my family's debts. I sleep with many men every day. They make me kill for a war. Work many long hours. Trapped. Beaten. Scared. Locked in the dark. With no way out. I want to go home. I want my freedom. 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 The last thing that we as Americans would, would remotely suspect is that the greatest engineering firm in the world, so named because they were able to build a Panama Canal when no one else could, the greatest engineering firm in the world caused, caused the flooding of this city. Not Hurricane Katrina, the United States Army Corps of Engineers.
and because of one negligent moment, it has become a painful and needless tragedy. The state of Louisiana's medical malpractice laws are full of traps and how the healthcare and insurance industries are far more protected than anywhere else. In Sharon Boxy's case, you will see how her doctors malpositioned her head and neck during surgery that substantially reduced blood flow through the carotid arteries to her brain causing massive brain damage which went undetected during surgery and rendered her a total quadriplegic. So far in 34 years, no one has come close to having a Supreme Court decision yeah. finding that the cap or the act was unconstitutional. Um, we are going to show right now uh, a day in the life of Sharon Boxy and what these doctors did to her. And you're quite familiar with this video that we have on the screen right now. Tell us a little bit about her daily activities. Well, her daily activities are markedly reduced. Her sister and her family have, have been incredibly supportive, uh, caring for her and doing the physical therapy and the other um, steps that are necessary to keep her alive and, and functioning as well as she possibly could. But basically, in the course of a day, uh, because of her limitations, she can do virtually nothing other than watch TV, talk with people yeah. who come over, uh, maybe read a little bit, but even read, I mean, she can't turn a page. She has no movement in her hands or arms or legs. Don mentioned to me, Sharon, that one of the reasons that you have so much drive and fortitude is you want to show others that the laws in the state of Louisiana aren't the best laws in the world concerning medical malpractice cases, right? That is correct. On July 26, 2003, at approximately 3.45 in the afternoon, Christopher Allison and his family were driving back to Pocatello, Idaho from their vacation in Washington. Suddenly and unexpectedly, their vehicle was struck by another driver from the rear, jackknifing their camper and overturning their Ford Expedition, crushing and killing Christopher and injuring the rest of the Allison family. Today, the Insider Exclusive will show you how the Allison's lawyers, Robert Krauss 
and Emily Rankin of the Spence Law Firm took on Ford Motor Company and successfully sued them for the defective product design of the door latch and component system and other defects and got justice for the Allison family. My name is Jeffrey Scott Hornoff and I'm a police officer. I was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Every step of the judicial system failed me and my family. And if not for the guilt and remorse of the true killer, I'd still be in prison. She died, I killed her. Why would you not want to ensure that California stops putting innocent people in prison? It's a very good question. I was locked up when I was 20 years old, just turned 20 years old. And I'm 42 now, so I've been in a little over 22 years. It was hard for my father to explain to me. I got convicted of raping somebody, but daddy didn't do it. So it was like, how you not do it, daddy? You've been in here for all these years now. Everything in life is wonderful, and then one day, somebody comes up and tells a lie on you, and you end up in jail. What's different is he knows fear doesn't exist. When they told me rape, robbery, Possession of instrument, a crime, a gun, a conspiracy, all these. I'm like, oh my God, you know, this, this is almost like 100 years in jail for something you didn't do, and I'm, I'm really scared. I was in shock because I got found guilty. I looked him right in the face and I said, You and I both know I didn't kill anyone. And he couldn't look me in the eye. He sentenced me to all that time, and I didn't know what to expect in prison. You know, I expected to uh, be beaten, be raped. I expected to die in prison. The government has failed the exonerated. It's finally over. It's been 19 years. What now? Go home. Dr. William J. Irwin failed to comply with the appropriate standard of care for an OBGYN in the year 2007. And as a result, Rebecca Gatti, a newborn baby, suffered severe brain damage, which is lifelong and irreversible. Those brutally frank words were how the Louisiana Medical Review Board explained to Ryan and Susan Gatti the parents of their new baby girl, Rebecca, why Rebecca had suffered irreversible brain damage due to the incompetence of Dr. Irwin and now will require round-the-clock care for the rest of her life with no chance whatsoever for improvement. Today, the Insider Exclusive will take you behind the headlines of this real-life couple, Ryan and Susan Gaddy, who entrusted their child's health and welfare to this grossly incompetent doctor. Following is a TV commercial for American Family Insurance. Since the dawn of time, people have needed people. The personal connection, 
the shoulder to lean on. That is our role. To deliver more than just a policy on a piece of paper. To deliver peace of mind. Because we are family. American family. And like family, we grow stronger each day with the constant promise to always be fair, helpful, and caring. Doing whatever we can to make things easier. Striving to keep our promises. This is what we do for our clients. We get to know them like family. Because that's who we are. American Family Insurance. But today, the Insider Exclusive presents a true, really tragic story, one that American Family Insurance doesn't want you to know. One hot Missouri summer day, Galen Ritchie's sister, Brenda, called her insurance company, American Family, and her agent, Catherine Philip Leitz, telling her that a 1,400 pound tree limb, nearly half the tree, had fallen on Brenda's house. She called three times that week, and on three separate occasions, American Family refused to pay to have this 1,400-pound limb removed. If you don't care about people, you couldn't do this job. Sounds real good, doesn't it? Only problem is, Anthem Blue Cross really doesn't mean what they say. Ask Bob Daringer, widow of Esther Daringer. 49-year-old Esther beat breast cancer until it metastasized to her brain. Ohio State University physician Dr. Herbert Newton, her physician, had successfully treated cancer like Esther's through intra-arterial chemotherapy. Her husband's health insurer, Anthem Blue Cross, paid for three of the 12 scheduled treatments. Bob and Esther first learned that the fourth treatment was being denied the day before it was given. The insurance company had approved the first three of the 12 treatments, but then refused further payment, declaring the procedure experimental. Cigarette smoking is the leading cause of preventable death in the United States. It causes serious illness among an estimated 8.6 million persons. It costs 167 billion in annual health-related losses, and it kills approximately 438,000 people each year. Worldwide, smoking kills nearly 5 million people annually. to stand here today with dedicated colleagues from within the Department of Justice as well as beyond it to announce a historic settlement with Pfizer Incorporated 
in a combination civil and criminal settlement, Pfizer has agreed to pay $2.3 billion, the largest health care fraud settlement in the history of the Department of Justice. You now know that exposure to asbestos products caused this. Yes. Not only in the Navy, but also working as a custodian at the school. Yes. You're on national TV now. What do you have to say to the manufacturers that created these products? Well, they knew years ago, and they should have started much earlier in the, uh, in the process of eliminating the asbestos from all their products. Mm -hmm. Uh, they chose not to, you know that. They chose not to. Uh, most of the major companies, uh, some that were, uh, that were litigated against, uh, filed bankruptcy and then turned around and regrouped and they were doing the exact same thing. They were going strong. Using the same, uh, same products. Yeah, they have a total disregard for human life, don't mm -hmm. they? Mark? They do. being a correctional officer and I chose that field because I wanted to make a positive impact on um, inmates. I view my prognosis as good. I, I keep responding to treatment and I was just talking to my sister yesterday because there's times where you get down and you think, oh, you know, you just want to give up. Uh, cannot operate with one hand. Dr. Anthony Sterling is an orthopedic surgeon who can no longer take care of his patients. He's been disabled ever since 1998 when he had surgery to remove a bone spur pressing on his spinal cord. The surgery did not turn out well. The worst thing that could happen to a surgeon happened to Dr. Sterling. During the surgery, he suffered a terrible injury that rendered his left arm completely paralyzed, and it remains paralyzed to this day, trapped in an ugly brace. So the man who routinely performed about 500 surgeries a year and expected to continue helping patients for another 15 years can no longer enter an operating room. Across the U.S., people are rising up against fracking for natural gas. A deadly threat to our homes and our lives is looming on the horizon. It is a new technique of gas oil extraction. It is known by various names, for example. The oil and gas industry says it isn't new. The industry says it's safe. 
but the industry is lying. The vertical gas wells are a completely different technology. The new technique of deep horizontal fracking destroys drinking water supplies, pollutes our air and our environments, and will continue to do so for possibly hundreds of years as the well casings inevitably fail and disposal sites inevitably leak. In this insider exclusive investigative TV series new documentary, Fracking, Dangerous Contamination, Bob and Lisa Parr's story, our news team found that in any area where fracking operations have happened, the local people have been outraged by the catastrophic damage to land, water supplies, air quality, animal and human health. Local economies have been destroyed, property values have fallen drastically up to 90%. And one of those areas is in Wise County, Texas, where the Barnett Shale is located. This is where we begin our story with Bob and Lisa Parr at their ranch and with their lawyer, Brad Gildy of the Gildy Law Firm. leaving only enough time, three seconds, for Clay Rush to possibly kick the game winner. Rush has made field goals of 20 and 26 yards, missed from 41. This one will be from 20 yards to win the Arena Bowl. When I think about football when I was playing, um, I like the challenges that it presented itself. You had to be physically fit. You had to be mentally fit. What's unique about arena football, I miss the fans. Um, it's a close-knit group. We consider us as a family. I've had over 30 procedures done with the head and neck. I've been on 90 different medications. I don't know what it's like not to have a headache. Their question you were here in July and you said that you were um, you commended Dodd Frank for providing a blueprint mm -hmm. to get rid of too big to fail we've now understood this problem for nearly five years so when are we going to get rid of too big to fail well some of the you know as, as, you, as we've been discussing you know some of these rules take time to develop um, uh, the Orderly Liquidation Authority, I think we made a lot of progress on that. We've got the living wills. I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, if additional steps are needed, then Congress obviously can discuss those, but we do have a plan and I think it's moving in the right direction. Any idea about when we're going to arrive in the right direction? <laughs> it's, it's going to take, it's, a, it's not a zero-one kind of thing. It's, it's, a, it's over time. The concern that you have raised is one that I frankly share. And I'm not talking about HSBC now, because that, that, that maybe that not be appropriate. But I am concerned that the size of some of these institutions becomes so large that it does become difficult for us to, um, to prosecute them when we are hit with um, indications that if you do prosecute, if you do bring a criminal charge, uh, it will have a negative impact on the national economy, perhaps even the world economy. And I think that is a function of the fact that some of these institutions have become too large. Tell me a little bit about the last few times you've taken the biggest financial institutions on Wall Street all the way to a trial. Anybody? I appreciate that you say you don't have to bring them to trial. My question is, when did you bring them to trial? 
uh, we have not had to do it as a practical matter to achieve our supervisory goals. Can you identify when you last took the Wall Street banks to trial? Um, I will have to get back to you with the specific information. These are just a few of the real Americans who have dealt with our legal system that is gradually eroding in favor of big business and the government because of tort reform legislation. And this is why we all need to protect a legal system that is designed to protect us and not one that protects corporate business or the government over the common everyday American. Bill Pickett, our featured lawyer, has earned the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike as one of the best civil rights trial lawyers in Yakima, in Washington, and across the nation. Late last year, Bill successfully won an appeal for his client, Eddie Ford, who the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that Mr. Ford was wrongfully arrested in a direct violation of one of America's founding pillars, the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, the right of free speech. As Bill has stated time and time again, citizens have an absolute right to be critical of law enforcement, and they can vocalize that criticism without any fear of being retaliated against. Bill has seen many innocent and hardworking people become victims of police brutality. He understands that police brutality is one of the most serious, enduring, and divisive human rights violations in the United States. The problem is not just in Washington, but nationwide and its nature is institutionalized. And because of that, he is driven to fight for people who have been harmed by the willful or negligent actions of others. He learned a long time ago that if a man hasn't discovered something that he will die for, he isn't fit to live. His goals, not only to get justice for his clients, but to make sure all Americans have the right to a fair trial, honest cops, impartial prosecutors, and fair judges with no agendas. Because injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And justice and power must be brought together so that whatever is just may be powerful and whatever is powerful may be just. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Yakima, Washington. It is my great pleasure to introduce Bill Pickett to the show. Welcome to the show, Bill. Thanks. Thank you. Good to be here. Tell our audience a little bit about your area of law that you like the best. The Pickett Law Firm specializes in uh, a lot of personal injury matters, but primarily um, our focus has been honed toward medical malpractice and police abuse cases. Mm -hmm. And those are uh, two areas that um, we have expended a lot of time and energy yeah. and resources in fighting for folks who have been harmed either by the police or by doctors yeah. and or hospitals. There's a lot of areas of law a lawyer can practice. You know, you could represent IBM, you could be a defense lawyer. There is. Why do you do what you do? I do what I do because I care about people. Mm -hmm. And I care about people who have been hurt by somebody else's negligence uh, and when I say the word negligence it's by people who don't care um, or if they care they've had a horrible lapse of judgment on a particular day and they have deeply harmed somebody mm -hmm. and changed their life forever mm -hmm. and it is an absolute honor and a privilege to be able to stand in the trenches with those folks 
and to try to do something sometimes um, that will help the person who's been hurt. And society as a whole. Uh, hopefully, you yeah. want every piece of the case that you handle, every case that you handle, you also want there to be a component of that case that makes a change that hopefully ensures, as best you can, that another person won't have to go through the devastation mm -hmm. that your client lives out every day. Right. This special documentary that we're doing deals with what is commonly known as tort reform or tort deform. In other words, we are producing this show and we've selected various trial lawyers to feature on, the, on this show because the American public on the whole are unaware of what trial lawyers do for them and more importantly there are some misconceptions about trial lawyers, about the judicial system that we need really to clear up and one of them right off the start is a lot of people, I think it's 54 percent of the American public think that trial lawyers are actually greedy individuals who file frivolous lawsuits in pursuit of jackpot justice. This has been propagated by businesses, it's been propagated by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce which represents corporate America. What's wrong with that statement? What is incorrect with that statement? Talk about that. Well, there's, there's, there's First and foremost, um, the word trial lawyer and who is, who is a trial lawyer um, includes a vast array of people, okay? All, every kind of personality uh, uh, and type of person you can think of is included in that. I'll speak directly to the people I know as trial lawyers and those are people that I would call my brothers and sisters. Uh, they are warriors who fight for people and they fight for justice. And they do it not because they're greedy, mm -hmm. and not because they're wanting to play some jackpot, uh, not because they're engaging in frivolous lawsuits. They're, they do it because they care about human beings who have been hurt. And in their heart and soul, they do everything they can to try to help those people. Yeah, and they do it with an investment of their time and with their own money. And I want to emphasize that. A great if, risk. If you go to a business lawyer, for example, and say, I want to incorporate, the lawyer will say, give me a $5,000 retainer, right. and you'll never see that money again, and whatever it costs. In these cases, when you're talking about trial lawyers, the one that represent the little guy, and that's what it's all about, right. these little people don't have any money. When, when somebody comes to you and they've been catastrophically yeah. injured, they aren't coming, you with a coming to you with a boatload of money saying, right. I want to hire you on a six-minute increment, and right. I will pay you for every six minutes that you put into my case. That yeah. doesn't happen. Yes. The people that come to see us typically have had a devastating event happen in their life where they need someone to shore them up, to help them to seek the justice that they want. Mm -hmm. And the, tr the trial lawyer... Um, or trial lawyers who do what we do, they are willing to put it on the line, both with all of, all of our resources, our energy, right. um, and our firm's uh, resources to fight for those folks. And we're not paid um, on a six minute increment like other lawyers. You're only paid if you win. You're paid if you prevail. You, yeah. You've got to prevail and you've got to win justice for the client or you go home with nothing. Right. The insurance industry, and let's talk about medical malpractice cases, which you represent many. Um, the insurance industry has convinced a majority of Americans that trial lawyers are driving up the cost of insurance. The American Medical Association has convinced their own doctors that without these big lawsuits against the doctors, the hospitals, insurance costs would come down. It is a fact in this country that of every state that has passed so-called tort reform laws which limit the amount of money that a person can recover from a doctor or a hospital, that in every single one of those states the insurance rates have increased more than the states without tort reform laws. How has so-called tort reform which is a lie. How has tort reform affected medical malpractice cases in the state of Washington? 
Well, fortunately, there was a huge movement several years ago and an effort by the insurance companies mm -hmm. to try to bring in tort reform in Washington State. And we were able to beat it back. Mm -hmm. um, we were with, at, at, no, at no small expense. Um, trial lawyers and consumer advocacy groups um, and some others banded together um, to defeat initiatives that were set forth primarily by insurance companies. Mm -hmm. Uh, who were making those same type of arguments. For instance, things like doctor's insurance premiums were going so high in the uh, uh, obstetrical field that doctors couldn't deliver babies anymore. They just yeah. couldn't afford the insurance. Or that hospitals were closing as a result of massive payouts on right. lawsuits. And the reality is, and the fact of it, the matter is, that wasn't the truth. Yeah. And insurance companies will do, they have played out a masterful deception on America in getting all of us to believe that lawsuits should be stopped because doctors need protection. And who doesn't want to protect a doctor? Doctors are the good people. Doctors are heroes. Doctors help people. But when insurance companies insure those doctors from their, from their errors, they know that if the doctor makes a mistake and as a human being they're going to make a mistake, that that insurance company is going to have to pay. And in the medical arena, those damages, those harms can be catastrophic right. and lifelong. Yeah. So the insurance companies have done everything they can to try to convince us, the people, that they need to limit these, these lawsuits or stop them because what they really want is complete immunity. Yeah. And they want to say, look, here, here's, here's if you uncover and you pull back the mask, here's what they're really saying. We collect a lot of money from hospitals and doctors, a lot of money in premiums. We want to keep our money. And in order for us to keep our money, we've got to figure out a way to stop people from suing. If we can stop those lawsuits, our doctors don't have to take, our, not our hospitals, don't have to take accountability. They don't have to be responsible. And we, the insurance company, get to keep all of our money. That's what they seek, what they really want. Now, they will present that to us as citizens in a multitude of different ways to try and convince us that what we need is to limit these lawsuits. We don't need to limit these lawsuits. We need the insurance companies to step up when there's been something catastrophically wrong that's happened right. and do what they promised to do all along and that is take care of it monetarily. Right. Right. They want to keep their money and that's why it's and that's all they care about and that's why it's so wrong. Right. And what the insurance companies have done is they want the doctors, let's face it, doctors are human beings. They are. Sometimes they make mistakes. They do. But when they make mistakes that cost somebody dearly, then they should be held responsible, Absolutely. not the taxpayer. And I'm going to explain that in a minute because if there is a cap, like down in Louisiana, yes. there is a cap of 500000 In California, there is a cap on pain and suffering of 250000 right. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, big deal, pain and suffering. But if you're unemployed, if you're elderly, you don't have economic value, let's say, then the most that you can collect in medical malpractice cases is limited to that cap. And if you have suffered a catastrophic injury as a, as a result of medical malpractice and it costs twenty million dollars or five million dollars over the rest of your lifetime to take care of you and if the doctor that committed the malpractice or the hospital that committed the malpractice are not responsible for paying who pays well typically you're going to end up with people on a state pay payer system a medicaid a medicare type of situation the and it'll ultimately be the taxpayer who's yeah. doing that so, so we are paying in these tort reform states the people that never committed the medical malpractice the common everyday average person is picking up the tab isn't that right that's true that a lot of people don't realize that they don't realize that that the that, that the responsibility mm -hmm. is obliterated mm -hmm. meaning you don't ha in a in a cap state or a state that has enacted these these supposed reforms um, the responsible party and ultimately their insurer walk away scot free and they laugh all the way to the bank yes and the taxpayers the citizens of that of the state that have those those, those reforms are ultimately going to pay the tab through either a Medicaid or a state payer system that allows that, that helps to compensate these folks who are catastrophically injured and that ultimately harms the community as a whole because the person or the entity responsible was not held responsible and that is harmful 
in it, wherever that's enacted. Because that doctor can go out and cause some more problems without never being checked. We have done stories where doctors have been impaired. To me, the word impair is a fancy term for either being drunk on the job or stoned on the job, right? And committing grave malpractice. And there's another element of this tort reform where in almost every state, I think every state, it is next to impossible to find out any disciplinary actions that have been taken against the doctor, the guy that's going to put a knife to your skin. You can't find out how many times he's been sued before. It's incredibly difficult. You have difficult. no way of knowing when you walk into an operating room whether that guy has been involved with 12 lawsuits already. Typically, that's absolutely true. And, and nobody, you, there, there would be, you know, some ability to dig into that information, but typically if we look at how things operate, people aren't going to have their surgeon investigated mm -hmm. prior to a surgery. They're going to trust. They're going to trust that the person that's taking care of them is going to do what they say they're going to do and yeah. that they're a qualified, competent person. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. And again, if we have in the civil justice system, the way it is supposed to work is those folks who commit malpractice or those entities that commit malpractice will be exposed to the civil justice yes. system and they will do one of two things. Mm -hmm. They will correct the misbehavior or they will go away. Yes. But if they're allowed to continue to perpetuate uh, sloppy care onto unsuspecting people, they will stay in it for the long haul. Right. So, in that sense, tort reform enables enables those folks and those entities that don't hold the, that don't hold to that high level of performance and take care of people the way they should. It enables them to be sloppy mm -hmm. and uncaring, and it's a disaster for the people who are harmed. Right. Let's talk about one other area of law that where tort reform has affected it greatly, and that is in police cases, brutality cases, excessive force cases, wrongful death cases. How has so-called tort reform made it harder for the average citizen to hold the police or law enforcement responsible? Well, tort reform in the, in the police misconduct arena takes on uh, what's oftentimes termed uh, qualified immunity. And what that essentially is, it's a legal term that says, look, even if a police officer kills you and we believe they violated your constitutionally protected rights in the, uh, in the way they did it, um, we are going to give them qualified immunity, which is just a fancy legal term to say we're not going to hold them responsible. Right. Um, and there are, you can look in the, the advanced sheets in the, in the jurisdictions around this country, there are a, new, a number of cases that are dumped that are kicked out, thrown out of court on this doctrine of qualified immunity. And it harms not only the person who loses their case as a result of that, but it also harms society as a whole when we are not allowed to keep the strongest, most aggressive arm of the government in check. And what I mean by that is police or law enforcement. They are the government. And in fact, they are the strongest, most aggressive part of our government in that they are all given badges, guns, swear an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States, and they are, in all reality, the only force within our country that can handcuff us, kill us, mm -hmm. when they choose to. And get away with it. And get away with yeah. it. Yeah. Now, how do you see, and what would you like to see, and this is the reason we're doing this show, how would you like to see changes so people become better educated, realize that many of their rights have been gradually whittled away? What do you want to see done? Well, I think people, first and foremost, people need to understand that trial lawyers are there to help them fight back injustice. Mm -hmm. And trial lawyers aren't the enemy. Uh, trial lawyers are there to stand in the trenches in, in some pretty dark mm -hmm. uh, and some pretty um, depressing situations mm -hmm. that people find themselves in. And then people need to know that they have rights to hold wrongdoers accountable. 
and it's called the civil justice system. The insurance companies like to call it lawsuits or suing, mm -hmm. whatever they want to call it. Let them call it what, what, whatever term they find favorable to them. But recognize as citizens that those lawsuits are about people being able to go into a courtroom and hold wrongdoers accountable. And any time a citizen in this country sees some piece of legislation or a politician or a person in the government talking about trying to eliminate lawsuits, we need to all see bells and whistles go off, see the red flags and say, wait a second, I'll stop. Right. Because you're using a lot of fancy words to say let's eliminate lawsuits or frivolous lawsuits or what have you. In reality, what you're trying to do, Mr. Politician or Ms. Politician or Mr. Police Officer, is what you're trying to do, or Ms. or Ms. or Ms. Insurance Company, mm -hmm. is you're trying to take away my right to hold people accountable right. in a court of law. Right. And we've got to stop that and not buy into the verbiage that tries to convince us to give up rights that were fought for. And when I talk about fought for, I go back to the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution that guarantees us a right to a jury trial in civil matters. And we hold those rights to be dear, and if we don't protect them and exercise them in the courts of law in this country, mm -hmm. those rights will be taken and stripped away. And what everybody knows is that once a right is taken, it's never given back again. And we, in a lot of situations and in a lot of places in this country, we are a thin, thin thread away from losing the valuable right to go to court to seek to hold wrongdoers accountable. And, as a, and that's about, to do that, um, is about as un-American a thing as I can think of. Right. Well, it, it absolutely is, and we certainly hope you're fighting the good fight and continue to do so. And I want to thank you very much for being on our program. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.